Now, the explosion of worship we had this morning with our team is a reminder of what's happening in the book of Mark. Because Mark begins his gospel by saying, the kingdom of heaven has exploded on the scene. God is here. The king is reigning. Join us and be part of it. Jesus is like a one-man army. He comes out, described in the Gospel of Mark, as the king is reigning. The king who's been predicted is here. John the Baptist predicts him. His father looks down, strings some pearls together from the Old Testament, says, this is my son, from Psalms 2, whom I love, from Genesis, and whom I delight in. That's him. The whole Bible testifies to him. He then goes off, prays. He's got such an authority and command of the scriptures. He walks into a village and his followers immediately follow him into this new life of reigning in the kingdom, of extending the kingdom of heaven. Then he comes to a synagogue, comes face to face with the forces of darkness and evil spirit, casts that out. And then as soon as he steps out of the synagogue, he comes face to face with sickness and he's going to combat that in the verses today. He's a one-man army. The king is here, and the king is reigning. And this chapter, like all the chapters we've looked at before, is another string of pearls. But there are so many pearls in today's passage. Instead of reading them all, I'm going to reference them all, and then we'll get to them as Mark gets to them in the passage. Because, again, we're talking about string of pearls because the Bible is filled with pearls of wisdom. And the New Testament is constantly assuming you have a reference point in your understanding of the Old Testament. We looked at a lot of Zechariah last week. Today we're going to look at some Daniel, a lot of Exodus. So let me pull out five different pearls of wisdom from the Bible in whatever random order they come in, and we're going to look at those as Mark does. So here in the, uh, in the Old Testament, our first scripture comes from Exodus chapter 19, verse 5. Huh? We'll use that one later. We're going to have another one from Isaiah chapter 61, verses 1 and 2. Man, they're all over the place here. Another one from Exodus 9.16, one from Daniel chapter 2, verse 44, and our last one here is from Exodus 15. So five different strings of pearls are going to be referenced in the idea that the kingdom is reigning that God predicted in the Old Testament. I'll touch on them real briefly in the order we, uh, we looked at them here. So the first one that came out was Daniel. Let me find that one. Daniel says there are going to be kingdoms coming on earth. Daniel predicts these in advance. The king of, kingdom of Babylon, followed by Persia, followed by Greece with Alexander the Great, and Rome. But he, he tells us there will be a kingdom that will come that will destroy those kingdoms. And this new kingdom will never be destroyed. This is a ki- kingdom that will consume all kingdoms and stand forever. So way back in Daniel, there was predicted a future kingdom where a king would reign. Our next one we looked at was Exodus 15, and that is here. Right as they finish crossing the Red Sea, Moses bursts into song, and the last line of his song is our first reference to God being a king that reigns. He sings, the Lord shall reign forever and ever. Speaking of God reigning over the kingdoms of Pharaoh by the crossing of the Red Sea and the destruction of their forces. Our next one we looked at is here in Exodus 19, verse 5 to 6. God not only has a kingdom, but he wants to set up a group of people who will be a kingdom of priests. That you're joining his kingdom, you're joining the king and reigning, and you will be a priest, a representative of the king to the inhabitants, and you'll represent the needs of the people to the king. God is about establishing a kingdom of followers, a kingdom of priests. Our next one was in Exodus, where Moses speaks about his purpose. Moses says, my purpose, here's why I'm here. It's a great verse for all of us, actually. How do you know what your purpose is? Moses says, here's why God raised me up. Two things. He wants to show his power through me, and he wants his name declared through me wherever I go on the earth. So keep in mind this phrase, this purpose. Then our last one is from Isaiah, and this is a prediction of the two things that the Messiah will do. He will preach good news, and he will proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. We'll dig into that as we get to it with Mark. If you ever watched the Chronicle of Narnia, or read C.S. Lewis, one of the analogies he uses is that Jesus is represented by the lion. He is Aslan. And all through the book you hear this phrase, Aslan is on the move. 
Aslan is on the move. The, the, the lion is moving and he's beginning to take back territory from the enemy. In a world that is always snowing but never Christmas, or the snow which is raining, Aslan is on the move. And that is very similar to the analogy used by Mark. Jesus, Aslan himself, is on the move. The king is reigning and he's moving through the land beginning to reign. And the question he asks us is this. As the kingdom is moving, as Aslan is moving, as the lion is moving... Are we around the lion or are we lying around? Are we around the lion doing the kind of work the lion is doing? Or are we lying around like, oh, that's nice, Bible, Jesus, God, can't wait to get to heaven. Some questions he's going to ask. We're going to find that Aslan is on the move in the synagogue. Aslan is on the move in the city. And Aslan is in the move in a solitary place. And when we tap into what Aslan is doing back then and now, we get to tap into our purpose. We get to tap into what God is doing in the relationships in our lives as well. Well, it begins with Aslan is in the move in the synagogue. Now remember, he's just come out of the synagogue. It says, as soon as, because he just defeated or cast out an evil spirit from the synagogue, which again is a reminder that you can have good church-going synagogue people who are demon-possessed. So keep that in mind, a little warning to all of us. Now, as soon as they had come out of the synagogue, they entered the house of Simon. Now remember, Simon's name will later be Peter. So Simon Peter and Andrew with James and John. So they entered this house of Peter and Andrew with James and John. But Simon's wife, Peter's wife's mother, so Simon Peter has a mother-in-law, Again, in some traditions, you hear that Peter was this, the first pope. And the idea that popes can't be married or that uh, representatives of God can't be married uh, really has a problem when you come to a passage like this. And you have to say, you know, which trumps, what the Bible says or church tradition? So here would be an example where what the Bible says seems to trump certain church traditions because Peter, the apostle Peter, has a mother-in-law. And, of course, it's hard to have a mother-in-law unless you're married, right? So c- clearly Peter was originally married. And his mother-in-law is sick with a fever. And they told Jesus about her at once. So he, Jesus, came and took her by the hand, lifted her up, and immediately, Mark's favorite word, the fever left her. And she served them. So we give you an idea where we're at. We're in Capernaum. This is one of the largest synagogues we mentioned last week uh, in the area. Gigantic synagogue. The synagogue, I had a chance to walk through it. It has a huge Torah closet, which is where you'd keep the scriptures. So huge, in fact, in the school that was attached to the side as well, this was a massive teaching. This would be like the Oxford or Yale of teaching rabbis and philosophers of the day. This was the go-to place to find the scriptures. And it's right here in Capernaum where Jesus has just walked out and is headed to Simon Peter's mother-in-law's house. So you haven't, you read that and you're like, well, how far is that? Is that, is he going across the Sea of Galilee? Is he running a you know, hundred miles? Well, here is where archaeologists are confident they have found Peter's mother-in-law's home. So this is not a long journey. It's another reminder that I think we grew up with this idea that all the disciples are poor outcasts. But you do not see that, especially here with Peter's, at least his wife's family. Incredible house. This house is the size of the synagogue. This house is in the business district. Right here is where they would do business. You can still find grinders for fish, grinders for bread. Artifacts are right there in that area. So these guys have this huge house right next to the business district, two doors down from the Yale Harvard of their day. And this is where Jesus and his disciples will often find themselves staying at Peter's family's house during this time. More than that, if I zoom out a bit, this is uh, some archaeological digs being done on Peter's mother-in-law's house. It's right on the waterfront. So again, these are professionals, they are entrepreneurs, these are business people that God is calling to take their skills and to go and change the world. He says, will you be around the lion and will you help me advance the kingdom by reigning with me? And they do. And I think our first lesson we get here is that being around the lion means serving other people. Jesus is all about service. He did not come to be served, but to serve. Take a look at this. As soon as he'd finished serving one man by getting him delivered from evil, as soon as he did that, he goes and helps somebody else with a fever. 
And as soon as he heals Peter's mother-in-law with the fever, what's her instinct about being around the lion? Her instinct of being served by the lion is to get up and serve others. I'm dying. I'm dying. Jesus heals you. Hey, anybody want uh, some snacks? (laughs) The instinct of learning and getting to know the heart of the lion is you see such a heart of servanthood. You, too, want to serve others. That's why service is such a big part of our church. That's why we have blue bags that we fill with, with canned goods to help with inter-parish ministries. We want to serve as, as Christ served us. We, we want to serve in all areas of our life. We, we have global serving opportunities. We're going to hear some stories this morning at 10, 11, 10 of those who just got back from our Cancun trip and our Belize trip about how we serve other people. How we work with orphans because we were orphaned. And God served us when we were poor in spirit and served us when we were needing adoption. So we go and do the same. But it's more than that. It's an attitude of service. It permeates everything. I want to direct my kids, yes, but I want to serve my kids as well. I want to serve my spouse. I want to serve them in the kitchen, helping out with things. I want to serve them in the bedroom. Christian idea of sexuality is that we serve one another. We're generous with our bodies. We want to serve our employees. We want to serve our clients. It's an attitude of service that permeates us as we begin to see his heart flowing through us. I got a chance to go to Washington, D.C. this week and I pray with uh, Secretary of Defense, uh, Veterans Affairs, rather, um, Bob, who goes to our church. And so I was praying for him. And I said, now, what are some of the challenges you're facing? And he said, the biggest challenge in heading the VA was trying to develop a customer service mindset. And how do you model that for people? And, and if you watch the news over the last nine months, you'll see that Bob gives out his personal cell phone number to all of our Congress members. He prints it in, in newspapers. He hands it out to homeless veterans. He wants to know that they are no longer a number, but they are customers and they have access to be served. And he said as he did that, it began to permeate the organization. As other people said, we're supposed to give access. We're supposed to treat people like customers. We're supposed to serve other people. That's the attitude of the lion, to serve others. Even those who disagree with us, as we'll see in a moment. So Aslan is on the move in the synagogue, but he's also on the move in the city. So at evening, and this is important, when the sun had set, because most of the people in this community are religious Jews, and they are not going to do work, which means moving people is work, until after Sabbath is over. So Sabbath ends in the evening at sunset, and now they brought to him all who were sick and were demon-possessed. Now notice this. They brought sick people... And they brought demon-possessed people. The whole city was gathered at the door. And he, Jesus, healed those who were sick with various diseases. He cast out many demons. And he did not allow the demons to speak because they knew him. He doesn't want to fully reveal his identity yet. But notice, the kingdom of darkness knows him. They're scared of him. The king is reigning. But also notice that these Jewish Followers of the Torah and God have friends who have spiritual needs. Now, some of them would be very easy conversation. How do you bring somebody who's sick? That'd be an easy conversation, right? Hey, I heard you're sick. You got a sore throat. I heard you got a bad leg. I want to introduce you to Jesus because he can heal you. Oh, that's an easy conversation. So head over and Jesus heals you. Easy introduction to Jesus. But I started thinking about the other one. They brought to Jesus those who were demon-possessed. How do you start that conversation? Hey, Bob. Bob doesn't live here anymore, Lizul. Hey, Bob, what are you doing Friday night? Uh, uh, how about we head over and meet Jesus? I mean, this is amazing to me. The word demon-possessed can actually mean demonized, which not just possessed, it means that there are footholds or strongholds in your life where you have given the devil an opportunity or, or you've given demonic... Um, power over an area of your life. That's why the New Testament warns us, even as Christians, not to put strongholds or footholds in our life. So these are folks who had, and that can happen in the Bible through bitterness, it can happen through idolatry, it can happen through pornography. There's all kinds of ways in which we give a foothold for demonic activity in our life. And so it's not necessarily somebody who's totally out of control. But these are truly folks who are given in to the other side, and they are friends with religious people who are drawing them and bringing them to Jesus. And as they do, Jesus is healing them. He's working with them. And I think that brings us to our application of this one, which is to be around the lion is to bring other people to meet the lion. Because when you get forgiven, you want other people to know that forgiveness. When you get free, you want other people to know that freedom. The best people for reaching those who are unconvinced are those who have just been freed themselves. 
We had a staff member this week. On Tuesdays, we share stories, or Wednesdays, of how God is working in our church. It's just an amazing time of storytelling. This week, one of our staff members said that as they've been attending over the years, they realize they've been so churchy in the language choices they've had, and they sort of rustle when they get around unconvinced people who use bad language. And ugh. But as they've been around here and seen our heart for people and serving people who disagree with us, who believe differently from us, that they're getting better at communicating. They talked about a friendship of 10 years of somebody who was very, very antagonistic toward the Bible and the gospel. And after been here for several years, they're beginning to learn how to have those conversations in a, in a normal way, not a weird way, not a religious way. And I got a text a few weeks ago from this person who said, I've decided to follow God and thank you for your patience with me. Thank you for being patient with my foul language. Thank you for being patient with my antagonistic attitude, me pushing your buttons. Your patience drew me to this Jesus. If you're around the lion, you develop friendships with people who do not believe the same way you do. And we talk a lot about our continuum around here, the continuum of people spiritually. You know, all unconvinced people are not the same. Some people are hostile. They have no awareness of God, no awareness of the gospel, and their only understanding of Christians are caricatures. All oh, those Christians, they're all brainless. They've all had a lobotomy. They're all judgmental. They've all waving their fingers. And they're all Republicans. They're all Democrats. It doesn't matter. I've been in churches that it's both. They're all these caricatures. They're hostile. And we as Christians have a tendency to think of them as combatants because they disagree with us. They're not combatants. They're potential customers. And we've got to change that mindset that the Great Commission tells us. These are not combatants. These are potential customers. And the greatest thing we can do with somebody who is hostile to the gospel is we're not going to get them to Jesus in one step. The next step for them is often to get to skeptical. And the reason how somebody moves from hostile to skeptical is usually this. They meet one decent, normal, real Christ follower. They still don't agree with the message. They still think it's ridiculous. They still think most Christians are idiots, except you. I've seen the way you treat your wife. I've seen how you handle your kids. I've seen the graciousness of your attitude. I've seen you at work. I'm still skeptical about the whole thing, but I now have a positive attitude toward a messenger of the gospel. There's one Christian that I know. And as you begin to share your story in a relational way, you begin to articulate the difference between the gospel from religion, the gospel from irreligion, the gospel from morality, and the gospel from immorality. The gospel comes to save you from your bad works, but also comes to save you from your good works. They say, what is that? And for the first time, they still don't believe it, but they're starting to hear it. And then they take another step, and now they're unconvinced. They're unconvinced the Bible's true. They're unconvinced Jesus is who he says he is. But now they have an awareness of the benefits. You know, over the years, I'll bring, I've had agnostic scholars up here. I've had Muslims up on stage. I've had Buddhists up on stage. I've had Jewish rabbis on stage. And as I'm dialoguing with them, I'm trying to move them from skeptical to unconvinced. I'm trying to get them sometime in our conversation to say, I see why you'd want to believe it. I can see how you'd want to know for sure that you're at peace with God because all other religions don't offer that certainty. Huh. I can see why it would be incredible to know you're going to see Grandma again. I can see the idea of a brand new body and a new heaven and a new earth would be very rewarding to know no more sickness and no more Alzheimer's. These people still don't believe it. They're still unconvinced, but they're starting to see the benefits of belief. Therefore, they're exploring their own doubts and their own hurdles. And then they get to the place of, Unawareness. They're unaware that they need to respond. I guess I believe Jesus died. I guess I believe he's on the cross. But they're unaware that they need to accept Jesus in their life. They're unaware they need to make a personal decision. And we need to build relationships with the unconvinced. That's why we do all the work we do as a church, to have four services and two are 100% different from the other two. Many of you got to experience our exploring service last week because of Time Change Sunday. And you noticed... We do not compromise the Bible. It's not church light. It's not gospel light. It is deep biblical teaching aimed at the unconvinced. Articulating their hurdles, their obstacles, their needs. And so we hope you love coming to our equipping service. We hope you love being equipped. But we hope you're around the lion. And the lion does not, getting around the lion does not mean hanging out with more and more churchy people. It means hanging out with more and more unconvinced. Because that's what the lion does. 
So being around the lion means bringing other people, whether it's people who are way off the deep end with the, with the demon possessed or folks who are just hurting emotionally or spiritually or physically. Well, the third area we see Aslan on the move is in a solitary place. And here we see the habits. We passed out a habits guide three weeks ago. Look at Jesus' spiritual habits. In the morning, having risen a long time before daylight, he gets up before other people. He went out and departed to a solitary place. He's got the discipline of solitude. He's got the discipline of prayer. I'm not a morning person. I'm probably never going to do that. I try and give my prayer time at the end of the day when I'm actually awake and God wants to hear from me. Um, But the discipline of prayer, the discipline of solitude, the discipline of seeking God. Look at this. And there, in solitude, he prayed. He's asking God for decisions. What do you want me to do next? What are your priorities? And Simon, also known as Peter, and those who were with him searched for him. And they, the disciples, found him and said, Everyone is looking for you. All the religious community is thrilled with what you're doing. The religious people want you to do more religious things for the religious people. Well, what's wrong with that? When Jesus says, well, I prayed about it, and we're not going to do that. We're going to go into the next town that I may preach there also. Remember from Isaiah. For this purpose, remember that from Exodus, I have come. We're going to find his purpose. And he was preaching in their synagogues throughout Galilee. So all the synagogues throughout Galilee, he's going to be preaching and casting out demonic forces. Now, here's our first string of pearls. There's two in here. One, Jesus says, I may preach. That verse comes from the one in Isaiah 61 that says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord has sent me to preach. So again, this is a very specific phrase that would have been Jesus alluding to the fact that he's a Messiah. Because everyone knew Isaiah said that when the Messiah comes, he will preach good news. And Jesus says, I'm not here to preach good news to religious people. I'm here to preach to the unconvinced. The problem with many of the religious people is they thought they were convinced and they really weren't. They weren't ready to be rescued from their, from their good works. So his purpose goes right back to this pearl of Isaiah, to proclaim liberty to the captives. Those are captive to the addictions, those captive to religion, those captives to whatever it was. But Jesus also says, for this purpose I have come. Again, first time this phrase is used is back in Exodus when Moses told us his purpose. And since Jesus is the ultimate Moses, he too is here like Moses was. He was raised up that God would show his power through Jesus and that the name of God would be declared through everything he did. And he didn't want to stay in a holy huddle. He wanted to keep going out and proclaiming and demonstrating the power of God. So that's our first two pearls. And he does that. In fact, this is a synagogue in Galilee. So we know for sure, based on that passage, that Jesus would have preached in this synagogue. This is to the north and to the uh, east of the Sea of Galilee. So I got a chance to visit there. It's called Gamla. Here is the synagogue. It... Uh, is one of the few synagogues that have most of the pieces parts in place, minus the walls, as far as the basic layout. So we took this camera shot from up here by this tree. So then we went down into the synagogue and took the picture the opposite way so you can get a feel for just how far that is. It's about a 45, 30 to 45 minute hike down to the synagogue. As you come into a synagogue, which Jesus would be speaking in during this time, they were usually laid out the same way. The first thing you'd experience was a mikvah, where you'd be washed, Usually men would go into the mikvah first and women later. You'd go in with a, uh, fully taking all your clothes off because you want to be fully washed to come into God's presence. After you washed, you'd put your robe back on. You'd enter into the synagogue. Over here would be the Torah closet where you'd have the Torahs of the scriptures that you'd be reading. The thing is laid out with seats all around the edges where you'd be seated greeting some friends and neighbors. Some chief seats up in this section for those who were important of the day. Remember, Jesus told his disciples, don't sit in the important seats. The chief seats, but allow somebody else to elevate you. And then the reader of the day would be reading the scripture from the middle here at the Bema. And then over in this section would be a school where people would be taught the scriptures during the week uh, or on non-synagogue moments. So that's what's going on. So Jesus is going to walk in through the back door of a synagogue like this. It's not this one. Um, He did speak of this one, but the passage I'm going to tell you in a second is not in this one. It's in Nazareth. They would have pulled the the Torah or the scriptures out of the Torah closet. So the Torah being the the books of Moses or the Old Testament. And Jesus would have brought that to the center. People gathered all around the edges and Jesus would be speaking. In fact, he is going to be speaking on the scripture reading of that day. 
is going to be from Isaiah chapter 61. So here's what happens. We're going to jump over to Luke for a moment. Jesus came back to Nazareth, his hometown, where he had been brought up. As his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day. He stood up to read. He was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah. And again, like a um, lectionary in a Presbyterian church or Catholic church, the readings are determined in advance. And Jesus happens to be there on the day that this was the passage he was chosen and had to read. So he didn't pick this verse. It was picked on the day that he showed up in the synagogue. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. And he closed the book. He gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And everyone would have said, mm, amen. That's right. When the Messiah comes, that'll be a good day. Mm. We've been reading that our whole life. And after you read, you would give a homily or a little sermon explaining some deep thoughts from that passage. So here's Jesus, the introduction to his sermon. Today, this scripture you've heard about your whole life is fulfilled in your hearing. He just said that he fulfilled it. He, he's saying he's the king. He's saying he's the Messiah. He's saying it's... How do you think the people react? Now, this is audience participation time in the sermon. How do you think people react? Who thinks the people are happy that he has declared himself to be the Messiah? Nobody thinks he's happy. Who thinks they're mad? Okay, who's confused? All right, that's, that's fine too. Now, if you'd asked me prior to reading this passage, I would have said they were mad. They are thrilled. Nobody raised their hand, by the way, so we, we can all be wrong together. They are thrilled. Now, why are they thrilled? I'll, tell you, I'll show you why they're thrilled in a sec. I'll show you where they're thrilled in a second. Here's why they're thrilled. They live in Nazareth. Nazareth, as I mentioned the last couple of weeks, means Branchville. They named this town Branchville because of one of the pearls, says the branch, the Messiah would come. And they living in this town were convinced the branch, the Messiah would come from Branchville. So when Jesus shows up and says, the branch is here, and he's like, oh, it's Joseph's son. We knew it. We've been right all along. So look what happens. They all bore witness to him and they marveled. Wow. At the gracious words, they're not mad, it's a great, oh, it's a wonderful news, which proceeded out of his mouth. And they said, is this not Joseph's son? Oh, he's one of us, just like we always thought. And then Jesus keeps preaching. And Jesus says something really obscure. He says, now you're going to surely say this proverb to me. Keep in mind this proverb is not in the Bible. I'll talk about it in a second. You're going to say this proverb to me, physician heal thyself. For you've heard what you've done in Capernaum. Why don't you do that here also? So we'll talk about the proverb in a moment. So he comes to his hometown and says, Guys, you've heard I did miracles in Capernaum, so you're probably wondering why I'm not doing more miracles here. So you're probably using that age-old proverb, Physician, heal thyself. To which we go, I don't remember that proverb. But if you lived during Jesus' day, you would know that proverb as well as we know the three little pigs. This is one of Aesop's fables. So here's Jesus quoting Aesop's fables the literature of the culture, to his Jewish friends in the synagogue. Let me tell you about Aesop's fable for a second. So it's an obscure one. It's about a toad, big warty toad, who comes to town, a group of animals, and he pulls out some ointment. He says, ah, I got some ointment for you. This ointment will clear your skin. If you will buy this ointment, you can have clear skin for the rest of your life. To which the animals look at the toad with all of his bumps and, and warts and say, Hey, physician, heal thyself. Clean up your own skin, and then maybe we'll buy your snake oil. So Jesus says, I know what you're going to say. You're going to quote that old proverb from Aesop, because Aesop's fables were very popular during this time. You're going to say, well, what good is it for you to heal people in Capernaum? Why don't you heal us in your hometown? Why don't you do good works and miracles here? And here's how he continues. So remember, they're happy. Until he says this, he says, I tell you the truth, no prophet is accepted in his own country. But I tell you truly, many widows were in Israel. Here's the key. There were many religious widows in the days of Elijah. Jewish religious people who had needs. And heaven was shut up for three years and six months. And there was a great famine through the land. We all remember that. Lots of reasons why God should have come to the religious people. But to none of them. 
was Elijah sent by God except to Zarephath in the region of Sidon. He's saying, even in a time of great physical need, God did not send Elijah to the Hebrew people, to the religious people. He sent people to the Gentiles, to the unconvinced. Now, already their smiles are starting to fall. He gives another example. Not Elijah, but Elisha. And many lepers were in Israel in the time of Elisha, the prophet. And none of them were cleansed. God didn't heal any lepers who are religious Jews. Instead, he sent Elisha to heal Naaman, the Syrian, the Gentile, the unconvinced soldier, the opposition to the Israeli army. In other words, he tells these religious people, I'm not going to stay here and hang out with the religious folks. I'm going to go and reach the unconvinced. Now, how do you think they react? Who thinks they're happy? Who thinks they're mad? Now, this is amazing because this is so true in churches all through history. Religious people with their traditions and their spot in the pew and their parking spot and how they like religious services done and all the other reasons. Religious people always want to kill Jesus for trying to reach the unconvinced. It comes out in different ways. Look how mad they are. So all in the synagogue, when they had heard these things, that God would want Gentiles, unconvinced people, they were filled with wrath. And they rose up and they thrust him out of the city. They led him to the brow of a hill at which their city was built, that they might throw him down over the cliff. Wow. They were so happy just minutes ago. Jesus, why couldn't you have left that part out of the sermon? Just talk about giving religious goods and services to religious people. Just keep the holy huddle happy. But he doesn't. He says, if I'm going to be about the Father's business, I'm about reaching the yet unconvinced. And I'm going to do it by quoting literature of the culture. And just as they're about to throw him off the cliff, then passing through the midst of them, he went his way. So they're just about to push him off the cliff, and we don't know what happens, but here, all we know is he gets through. So, push him off! And just, and Jesus, who knows if he stopped time, we don't know how he did it, but he sort of walks through and is like, hey, see you guys, and gets away. The opposition from the religious people. If we're going to be around the lion... We have got to be about strategically reaching the unconvinced. Many people will come to our 10 or 11 10 service and say, why are you guys doing secular music? Oh, that anti-Christian music. Oh, we're doing exactly what Jesus did. We quote the culture and the prophets of the day and use that as a springboard to share the gospel. We just happen to have a band who can play the prophets. I'm sure Aesop's fables would have sounded a lot better put to music. So that's what we do at 10, 11, 10. Paul does the exact same thing in, in the book of Acts. He says, your poets have said, he quotes their poets, and their poets say, we are all offspring of the Almighty. And then he uses their poets as a bridge to spiritual conversations. In one sense, there's no such thing as Christian music and secular music. There's music that draws you toward truth, and there's music that doesn't. That doesn't mean every song that Elton John does works, but when you hear his song, Blessed, of what it means to want to be blessed by a father, he stumbled onto truth. And so we quote the poets and use the poetry to reach the unconvinced. And that's why at Horizon we are about two things. We are about reaching the unconvinced and equipping the convinced. And part of equipping the convinced is not just having our own service. It's saying, I want to come and be equipped, but I want to be challenged to be building relationship with people who are combatants who I want to start seeing as customers. And I want to use these tools you're providing as a church, the tool of an exploring service and the tool of an equipping service, to bring my friends. Many people will come to one of our services, and then if they don't have a friend that day, they'll serve during the other service. Other people will come to one service, and then they'll meet their friends out in the lobby and come and sit with them and ask questions afterwards. That's why we do. I think we're the only church in the, the, the America, at least, that's trying this two-service design on Sunday. We have consultants come in all the time. They're like, what? Why would you do that? That sounds like a lot of work. You're preaching two messages. How do you do that? I say, I have split personalities. It works really well. <laughs> We're the only church that's doing it because we are so convinced that that's what the Great Commission is about. You can, can't do just one or the other. So here's the question again. Aslan is on the move. You and I. Are we around the lion doing the things the lion is doing? Are we just lying around? Doing our religious thing in our religious huddle? 
Are we developing spiritual habits like the lion? Are we bringing other people to get to know the lion? Are we drawing ourselves toward a life of service where we're beginning to serve everybody in our lives like the lion? That's what it looks like. So our last pearl. Remember I told you Mark spoke of a kingdom. The idea that the kingdom is here, that all heaven is breaking loose, comes right out of these ideas from the Old Testament. Three pearls put together. You see, if the Lord is reigning forever and ever, if the king is going to be here, as Moses told us, and if in Exodus we're told that God doesn't just want to reign himself, he wants to reign alongside a kingdom of priests. He wants us to be a holy nation. Peter will reference this in First Peter as well. That you and I are part of the kingdom. We're valuing the kingdom. We're an ambassador to the kingdom. We're extending the values of the kingdom. We're showing in a kingdom of darkness what this kingdom looks like. What does the kingdom look like right here and right now in this world? We are ambassadors. We are a kingdom of priests. You and I. Not the pastor, not a priest. You are called priests if you're a follower of Christ. And your job is to extend the reign of the kingdom here on earth. And the kingdom you're offered is the one Daniel spoke about. It's a king that will never be destroyed. It will consume all the other things of the world. Babylon, its beautiful gardens are gone. Persia and its mighty fortresses are gone. Greece, Alexander the Great who conquered the world just a few short years, he's gone. Rome and all of its power got totally undermined and destroyed by, by a group of Christ followers who began to talk about generosity to the poor and being stingy with your body and saving it just for marriage. And they talked about loving other people and starting schools and starting hospitals and caring for the orphan. And this kingdom that Jesus began toppled all those kingdoms. And he says to you and I, what are you lying around for? The kingdom is here. Join the king as he reigns in this world, in your community, and in your family. Don't lie around when you can be around the lion. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the incredible calling you've given us as your followers. Thank you for the incredible strategy you've allowed us to be part of here as a church. We thank you that we can cooperate with your great work in our friends, those who know you and those who don't, those who hate you and those who just aren't convinced about you. Teach us to love the way you love, to serve the way you served. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thanks for being here today.